Um, so a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, uh, we'll start with a slideshow that um, Ashley and I have uh, prepared. Uh, and then we'll later have some time for, um, for a Q&A session. Uh, we will ask you to submit any questions through the chat facility and um, we'll try and answer as many as we can. If we don't get to everything, uh, please bear with us because um, uh, we will follow up by email or some other way afterwards. Um, we will also record this webinar, so uh, we'll send you a link later also to uh, some colleagues who may not be able to join themselves uh, today. Um, and we hope that this will be a good way to spread the word about um, various things we want to uh, tell you about. So um, we'll give you a... Um Oh, Ash Ashley, can you hand over the control to me so you can move the slides? Mm, I don't have it anymore. All right, okay, we'll find this. We'll start with the... Um, so the, uh, I can give you a brief you outline of the, uh, of the webinar. We'll, uh, we'll give you a short um, introduction first, um, just to, to give you, to put what we do in a bit of uh, a broader context. And Ashley will then tell you um, about the open access uh, policy at the foundation uh, and specifically uh, the Kronos um, submission system that the foundation has created for you and various other things. I will then uh, talk about Gates Open Research, the publishing platform um, that the Gates Foundation has set up, why we do this, who can use it, and um, some details about the publishing model we use. Uh, and I'll also give you a very brief summary of um, where we've got so far since um, Gates Open Research launched last year. And as I said, at the end, we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers. Um, and so with this, um, As a, as a, just a brief background, um, there are a number of themes that we're interested in and that you will find recurring throughout this uh, presentation. Um, uh, the Gates Foundation and F1000 really share a great interest in uh, transforming how research is communicated and to go beyond open access. The foundation is, uh, is amongst a number of key funders that have developed early on uh, very strict open access policies and mandates. Um, as many of you will know, there's an increasing demand that um, research uh, results are disseminated quickly and that access is given early on, in particular when uh, new health emergencies um, arise. There is uh, an increasing demand for much more transparency during the publication process. And um, we and others have really recognized over the years that there is a lot of inefficiency in the system. So um, there's a lot of research waste, often um, uh, very valuable research findings don't get written up because the publication system can be quite complicated. There's a challenge with reproducibility, often because um, the data underlying the findings are not available. And generally, we find that there is quite a strong bias in the published literature towards positive results, uh, which really gives us a very incomplete scientific picture. And uh, as I said, you will find these themes recurring and uh, we will come back to this throughout the presentation as we think that these are all important things that we want to address. So with this I'll hand you over to Ashley who can um, give us uh, an overview of Foundation's perspective. Great, thank you and thank you for joining us everyone. So I'm here to talk about the open access policy at the Gates Foundation. Uh, it's really connected with our overall mission at the foundation. You know, we really believe that barrier-free access to foundation-funded research advances innovation and helps us solve the problems that we are looking to solve. And one of our um, 
main values is that all life have equal values, and I think open access to research is definitely tied into that. So, oops, sorry. So what is our open access policy? So we like to think of it as four requirements and a commitment. So we require that any uh, grantees or subgrantees publish their research open access, meaning it's discoverable and accessible online on open access terms. Uh, having it published under CC BY license is really important to us. That is the only license that is compatible with our policy. And then no embargo. So the publications need to be accessible and open immediately. We also require that the underlying data that supported the research analysis is made accessible and openly available upon publication as well. And then our commitment is that we will pay the reasonable fees to publish on these requirements so it doesn't come out of your grant budget and there's no cap on how many articles you produce or at what time you produce and publish them in. So what does this mean for grantees? So the open access clause is actually contained within a publications and peer reviewed journal clause that's in all grant agreements from January 1st, 2015 on. And we invite anybody with grants uh, before then to opt into the policy and we'll cover those publishing fees, but it is a requirement for all grants post January 1st, 2015. It's non-negotiable, no exceptions will be made. Our executive leadership team has held quite firm on this. And then uh, our goal, of course, is to continue to reach 100% um, compliancy to really ensure that our research is openly available to all. And then Kronos is a a system that we've built to help all of our grantees comply with the policy. It's one of the first uh, times that we've been able to track our research output publications uh, connected to grants specifically. So you can request access from um, chronos.gatesfoundation.org using your Gates grant number. And then once you're in the system, you can be connected to all the grants that you work on and actually publish uh, from those grants instead of going to the journal site. And so this allows us to get some great data on, on publishing trends within the foundation, as well as support those fees so we know when um, the article is going to be published and we can work with the publisher to make sure that we pay um, on the author's behalf. And this is how anyone or any grantee can submit to Gates Open Research. So we're integrated with F1000 submission system so we collect that um, submission information and then you are turned over to F1000 for the review process. So Kronos isn't involved in that part, uh, but they come back into play when it's time to pay the invoice. And I believe that is everything I have to say and I'll turn it back over to Michaela. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so Gates Open Research is really, um, as Ashley said, a new initiative set up by the Gates Foundation to support its grantees. Um, F1000 is, is the publisher operating this publishing platform on behalf of, of the foundation. And this is why I'm explaining the uh, process in a little bit more detail. The important thing to bear in mind is that uh, it's a fully open access uh, publishing platform, so anybody can read and access the content. But what we publish is strictly funded uh, by the Gates Foundation, either partially or wholly through uh, Gates grants. And as researchers, as Gates funded grantees, you can publish any results that you think are worth sharing. Um, and as I said earlier, we are very keen to make sure that results can be disseminated without any delays, that we address issues around research waste and increase the efficiency with which um, results can be published, and that we make it much easier for researchers to um, publish in a reproducible manner and increase the transparency. And Gates Open Research is very much set up to do all of this. Um, we were very pleased that um, the president of global health at the foundation, Trevor Mondale, um, lent his full support to the, um, 
to this new publishing platform and in particular um, the importance of um, sharing data and giving the access, full access to the publications. I would really recommend if you have a chance to, to read this blog, which he um, wrote at the time of the launch of the uh, platform. Uh, and as I said earlier, we, we will send around a link um, to this webinar so you'll be able to access all of this information and find the link to the blog in here. So to give you a brief um, overview of uh, Gates Open Research, this is uh, what the platform uh, looks like when you come to it. Um, it's important to, uh, to let you know that the Gates Foundation is not alone with this uh, initiative. F1000 Research is our own publishing platform um, with which we developed and pioneered a whole new uh, publishing model. We then set up a platform for the Wellcome Trust um, more than 18 months ago. This is Wellcome Open Research. And then uh, Gates Open Research uh, started uh, eight months ago. And there's an increasing number of uh, research organizations, uh, institutes, and, uh, and societies or, or uh, organizations like, for example, the African Academy of Sciences that have started their own platforms. And they all share the same uh, goals of giving faster access to high quality um, publications and, and add more transparency to the process. Gates Open Research has a very eminent um, advisory board, um, which you can see here, representing uh, different areas of uh, the disciplines that are funded by the Gates Foundation. And in a nutshell, um, there are a number of key differences. Um, between Gates Open Research as a publishing platform from uh, traditional journals. Uh, one important aspect is that uh, it's a very fast way to publish your research. We can uh, publish articles within a week of submission if, if the authors work with us and get everything ready in time. A very important component is that it's, it's fully inclusive, so really any research funded by the foundation is suitable. We have lots of different article types and outputs that we welcome. That includes um, traditional research articles, but also methods, software tools, data sets, protocols. And what's important, we also encourage the publication of negative and confirmatory uh, results because we feel it's really important to complete uh, the scientific literature with those findings. It's entirely open and therefore fulfills the foundation's open access requirements. We have a strong um, open data uh, um, policy. Again, this is in support of uh, the foundation's um, uh, requirements and policies. Um, it's a fully transparent uh, publishing process, and I'll take you through the details in, in a minute. It's entirely open, the peer review is open, and the publishing is very much led by the authors who are closely involved with the peer review all the way through. And as Ashley said earlier, it's, it's very easy for grantees because um, we're directly linked in with uh, the Kronos portal, and so all the costs um, for publishing on this platform are directly covered by the foundation. So you as um, grantees and authors don't need to worry about um, any of those aspects. So how, how do we achieve these ambitious um, goals? Um, how does this work? So we have um, a publication um, model, which we call post-publication peer review. The peer review, as the title implies, takes place after the publication. We, we receive the submissions. We don't have an editor who makes a decision to accept or reject the manuscript. Um, the, the thought behind this is really that a grant that has undergone the careful vetting through the peer review at the Gates Foundation has already been um, deemed as a good project and now we want to allow you as grantees to really share what you found with the 
uh, with the project that, uh, that was approved. We, we carry out very careful um, in-house checks on each submission, and this includes um, objective checks, such as uh, a plagiarism check, if, it's, uh, if, if the research involves um, human uh, data, we'll make sure that uh, there's ethics approval in, uh, uh, provided, that there's consent to publish. Um, we make sure that the source data are available at the time of publication. So before the article is published, we work closely with the authors to help them find suitable data repository and to make sure that the data are all available. But once all of these checks have been done, we um, fully format and typeset um, the article and publish it then very quickly. And at this time, the article has not yet undergone peer review, but we start a fully transparent, invited peer review. And by this we mean we name the referees and we also publish the referee report alongside the article. And authors can then revise and address any criticisms and we publish in uh, versions. And once um, a paper has passed the peer review, it's then fully indexed in PubMed and other bibliographic databases and becomes part of the formal scientific literature. So I can show you some examples from Gates Open Research um, to show you what this looks like. So here is an example of an article which at the time when I took this picture had just been published. And you can see that it's very clearly labeled as um, that it's a version one and that it's still awaiting peer review. Um, on the right hand side, you can see our open peer review box. Uh, which currently says it's a racing peer review as well. But what's important is it, it's a full article at this point, so it's immediately citable, and it can accrue um, usage data. So you can see that within a couple of days of publication, this article had already over 100 views, and some people have started to download it. Um, Here's then an example of an article that um, has already received some peer review reports. Again, that information is available in the title and in the open peer review box. So you can see um, uh, the names of the referees and you can uh, see, you can click on one of these read report um, uh, uh, buttons and that takes you to an example a peer review report, which is a full report, as you would expect to see it also in a traditional journal. But the key difference is that you have the author, uh, the referee's name here, together with the affiliation. If you're interested, what their expertise is, you can look them up. Um, you can see that we ask um, referees to choose uh, an approval status. They have a choice between three different types of ratings. Um, they can choose an approved if they're essentially happy with the article, an approved with reservations if they have uh, concerns and would expect to see some revisions, or a not approved if they have really uh, serious uh, uh, worries about uh, the scientific soundness. Um, authors require to get either two approved from the referees or one approved and two approved with reservations in order to get their article indexed in PubMed. And of course, authors then need to be able to respond. Here's an example of, a, of an author response, which is then also published alongside um, the referee reports. And authors can then publish new versions. So here's an article um, where you have three versions already. This information is again, in the, in the article title, and the overview of the history is on the right-hand side. And the referees can then revise the status of um, uh, the article, depending on whether they feel uh, that their concerns have been addressed or not. And there's always a little summary box um, with each version that explains the changes um, in a nutshell 
uh, to save people time to, to plow through all the details. The latest version is always the uh, default version, but you can access the previous versions if you're interested. As I mentioned before, we, we really try to ensure that uh, the research that is published on Gates Open Research is reproducible and that users have all the information they need to uh, repeat the work if they want to. For this, we have an open data policy that is mandatory, so it's important that the source data underlying the results are available. They must be hosted in a stable repository and we, we have a lot of guidelines um, and support for the authors to help them with this process. It's important that the data are clearly described so others really can see what's been done and how to reuse them and they need to be openly available. We know that this is not always possible when it comes to patient data, etc. but we always work with the authors to try and find um, uh, ways around this or, or identify what sort of data can be provided. And the same is true for source code. If, if authors publish a new software tool where the source code is really essential, then we ask for this to be provided. And here you can see an example of the section that we then include in the article, which gives you a summary at a glance where the data and where the software is available with a DOI where it can be accessed and also the license under which it has been deposited. So you can see immediately as a reader whether you can reuse it or not, or how you can reuse it. It's always, it always has to be under CC BY license. Um, and just before I um, finish, I want to give you some, uh, a very brief overview of where we are at now. Gates Open Research um, launched about eight months ago in November last year. And since then, we've published uh, 53 articles. You can see on the right that we have, uh, we have a lot of different article types that we do publish. Most of what we publish are research articles, but we've had quite a few study protocols, some data notes, um, some shorter articles, tools, etc. During this time, uh, 38 of these 53 articles have already passed peer review and are indexed in, uh, in PubMed. The remaining articles are at various stages of the peer review um, and, uh, and, and will hopefully eventually get uh, uh, past that stage. And during this time, we've published um, 143 open referee reports, which of course are a real uh, uh, treasure to look at because it's often really interesting to see what the referees had to say about it and, and it really adds to the discussion around an article. And our peer review is, uh, is quite fast. It uh, takes uh, the median number of days to the first referee report being published is 19 days and then um, 33 and a half days to the second referee report and then it takes about one and a half months for um, an article to be indexed in PubMed. Um, I did not talk much about the author's involvement with the peer review, but uh, we, can, we can talk about this uh, perhaps during the questions if anything comes in. in in essence, the authors are very closely involved with this peer review all the way through. We ask authors to suggest referees by certain criteria, or if they can't find referees themselves, we will help and make sure that uh, authors are happy with the, with the expertise of those referees that we choose. And uh, everything, as I said, is completely transparent, so uh, readers can always see what, what goes on. And uh, finally, if you have time for more uh, reading, we've published a number of interesting blogs, some uh, exchanges between authors and referees, which really give a good insight into the author's experience on what it's like to use this very different uh, publishing modus and the advantages the Open Peer Review can bring uh, to this whole process. Um, and with this, 
I think we're already ready to take some questions. Um, and so we would um, encourage you to send some uh, questions through the um, chat, if you have. Um, so far, we haven't received very much uh, through the live uh, participants, but we've had some questions ahead of the, of the webinar. Um, so I can start with those. Um, Ashley, I think the first question that we had was um, uh, somebody asked how Gates is supporting the sharing of data sets and whether there's perhaps some funding to support this. Do you want to? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And we are starting to have more discussions internally about um, kind of how that model would work. Uh, we have supported individual uh, data deposit costs on a case by case basis. Um, so you could definitely get in touch with me and see if, if that's something that you'd be eligible for. Mainly, they've been uh, kind of small amounts for, say, depositing in Dryad, and we supported that along with the open access publication. So usually, uh, we want to make sure that we are also covering uh, an open access charge along with those fees. So we're not just depositing um, a data set without having it being associated with a publication. That's kind of our viewpoint right now. But I think we have, we're having larger discussions around how we can better support uh, the, the requirement for sharing of underlying data. We have some basic guidelines on our, our policy uh, FAQ page, but we're are always open to hear your experiences and how we can better uh, help support them. Um, so hopefully we'll have kind of more on this in the future, but for individual questions or needs, definitely reach out to me. Great, uh, that's, that's very helpful. I'm sure that uh, uh, those listening in found that very useful. There was also a question about um, guidelines and resources to help um, uh, grantees establish a more open access friendly data sharing agreement with um, with the partners so I, I know that on gates open research it, uh, we, we have a number of uh, data guidelines that are available to authors that, that people might find useful including a list of suitable um, uh, uh, repositories and uh, uh, formats that people should submit. So that's a good starting point. But Ashley, do you, do you have anything to add? I know that the foundation also gives some guidelines around data sharing. Yeah, yeah we do on our, our policy FAQ page. They're at this point fairly open as we learn more about the types of data that our grantees are generating and any uh, limitations or concerns around those and how to best facilitate that. Uh, but we're also very happy to um, meet with groups and, and discuss kind of the process that we went through in setting up a, a policy and the implications that came along with implementation and how that works. And then as far as, as re additional resources, we are also part of the Open Research Funders Group, which while it's, it's focused on organizations that are funders, we are also producing some kind of basic um, policy 101 guidelines and how to reach out um, um, to individuals to set these types of agreements that could be helpful when you're navigating more of that policy setting um, space. And at this time, we, we haven't, you know, funded any initiatives like this, um, but it's, it's great to get these kind of questions and see that there's interest. In, in kind of facilitating those conversations and, and policy changes in, in grantee or subgrantee organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, so we've had a question come through about, um, can submissions only come from grantees or can they also be submitted by partners? Um, this is when uh, grantees co-author articles um, uh, that is funded by the Gates Foundation, but the manuscripts themselves are led by uh, partners who did the research directly. Mm -hmm. Now, my my understanding is that 
it might be better for you to answer this because people can, if you're a grant holder, you can assign sub grantees to the grant and that's how this is managed, right? Correct. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So the really only, um, uh, thing that we require to kind of uh, ascertain eligibility of publishing is having your Gates grant number, and that should be available to anybody who's working under the grant as long as you ask maybe the PI or whoever uh, you are connected with that is, you know, kind of on that layer of, you know, here's the grant, and then here's who we only give it to, you know, we have one point of contact, and then it kind of builds out a grant tree from there of everybody who's working on the project. And uh, we support any, any research outputs that have been funded in part or in whole. So that would be more of the in, in part. And then you just need to know your, we call it the op ID. So it begins with OPP followed by a string of numbers. Um, we also do support publications under contracts. Um, so those, you know, you just need to be able to provide and we can confirm um, your grant or contract number. Okay, um, great. So we had another question, which I think is, is quick to answer. Is it correct that grantees are obliged to publish in Gates Open Research? And the answer is uh, no. This is an option for grantees uh, to choose, but uh, you can publish in any journal that meets the Gates Foundation's open access requirements. Is that Correct. Correct? <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. And then to add another thing, uh, just in case this is another question that people might have um, with the post-publication peer review model, this, this is, not a preprint server, um, so you cannot submit something here in Gates Open Research and then also submit it in another journal. So this is a, a standalone publication, um, so sometimes that can be a little confusing, but of course, yeah, we, we welcome, uh, I think it's a fantastic experience and the grantees should, should have with either a research article or maybe start out with a smaller um, portion of your, your project, and uh, I think we've had a lot of uh, happy authors so far. Yeah, that's right. Um, so then there was a question about, um, so if we have a lot, I'll just read this out. If we have a large study, which we expect to have several publications, should we um, uh, sit on them until they're all ready, otherwise, um, uh, people's, people worry that if they release the data with the first publication, can they then be scooped by other publications? And I, uh, I know that this is often a concern um, for authors if when we talk about sharing the, the source data, and there isn't always an easy answer for this. Um, in general, what we do at Gates Open Research is we don't, we don't always ask for everything that you have to do with your project, but what we want to see are the data that are directly associated with the results that you show in your article. And always with the idea in mind that if somebody else wants to not just check your findings, but really build on it, are they, do they have all the relevant information that includes all the details about the methods and the analysis, but also the data that you use to generate those results. And this, this always sounds very scary, but in practice, this is often um, quite, a, quite a specific um, uh, part of a larger data set. So this is often a way to get around it. We don't always ask for the full raw data, but often uh, but the source data, which can sometimes be processed to, to cover a particular aspect of the, of the project. Um, but this is, of course, not specific to Gates Open Research. Um, and I don't know whether, whether you want to add something, um, Ashley, because this is, of course, the foundation is asking for the underlying data. So do, do you have anything else to add to this? I would just say that we don't have any um, formal timeline requirements. Um, so, and then we kind of, in regards to IP and patents as well, kind of recommend that then wait to publish until you're fully ready to, to share those components. Uh, I think, Michaela, you answered it really well. And yeah, there's no, no requirements from our end on when publications occur. Right. 
Yeah. Um, we had a question here about who's called a grantee, only the entity who benefits from the Gates Foundation or any people who want to publish on this platform. So this is just to clarify again, it's you have to have um, either direct funding, you have to have a, a grant number from the Gates Foundation to be able to publish on Gates Open Research, but as Ashley explained earlier, you don't have to be the primary grant holder, this may be through a, a subcontract with a, with a grant holder, but the research needs to be linked to a Gates grant. Yeah? Actually, Great, yes, um, yes. Um, and if there are any other, any questions or concerns or you know you need help uh, navigating to figure out if that's the case, definitely feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can help make, make sure we answer that definitively. Yeah. Uh, there was a question, will uh, the Gates Foundation pay the open access charges for other journals, such as The Lancet? And the, the very short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all done through uh, the Kronos uh, submission portal. So um, hopefully that's, uh, that's self-explanatory when people come to Kronos. Um, yeah, and we understand that it, it takes uh, time to publish as well. We're, we're moving towards, you know, ensuring that in the future all grantees are submitting their manuscripts through Kronos. Uh, but understand that this takes time. Uh, Kronos has been around for almost two years since we've launched. But if you have already entered into the publication process with the journal and need your invoices uh, paid, uh, we will still cover those and, and kind of ingest the information into Kronos. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question which um, actually you've, you've more or less answered already. Do authors send the articles exclusively to Gates Open Research or do they then also publish in other journals? And again, the answer is that Gates Open Research is really an alternative to a journal once you have published your article. And as I said, it will hopefully pass peer review and be indexed in PubMed, you cannot submit it to another journal. It's a full publication in its own right, which you can add to your CV and you get credit for, um, as you do with other uh, article publications. Um, uh, what is the policy on reusing published data? So the articles and also the underlying data are um, published under a CC BY license, which um, means that the authors have the copyright, but they allow others to reuse um, the article and, and the associated data, uh, but normally by giving credit to the authors as the, as the um, uh, or th those who created the data and, and the article in the first instance. Um, Ashley, you just bought in if, if there's anything. <laughs> I'm just looking at more. Yes, agreed. <laughs> um, are there details available on how and what should be shared for qualitative research? Um, a series of key, for example, a series of key info informant interviews and focus group discussions, audio clips. Um, this, is, this is hard to, uh, to answer um, very uh, uh, generally. It's, so we, we definitely welcome qualitative research on, open, uh, on Gates Open Research. Um, and uh, if it's interviews, for example, this, these are, of course, uh, people involved, so we uh, the, but when we look at the data underlying those uh, findings, uh, we have to be careful that we don't share confidential information. So we always work with the authors with this. There's no, um, no I, I can't really answer this until we've seen a specific manuscript. And what we tend to do is really work with the authors and try and work out what, what, is the, what, what are the data that you can provide for this and what would be useful for the referees to assess what you have done and for readers to really make the most of the findings. But uh, we certainly have examples of um, 
surveys that people have done who then provided uh, some of the uh, certainly the questionnaire that was used and some of the answers if they can be anonymized etc but I can't give a complete answer to this because it's very much on a study by study um, basis um, I wonder how we're doing with time yeah we have we have another five minutes or so um, so I had a I had a question before um, uh, uh, before the webinar started, somebody wanted to know what happens when um, a paper receives negative referee uh, reports. And we do, I'm, I'm, uh, we are asked this a lot because that is a worry for authors, of course. But you have to uh, bear in mind that this peer review is, um, is transparent. The referees have to put their name to, to the report. So in our experience, they tend to be very constructive and really aimed at helping uh, the authors. Um, we have critical referee reports, no doubt, but authors can always respond and uh, ha can take as much time as they like to uh, revise and publish new versions. The referee reports and the articles always uh, stay up, but um, uh, as I said, the authors can, can come back and make changes as they see fit. And this is very much led by the authors who can decide how they want to deal with it. But in our experience, this open peer review makes for a very constructive dialogue between authors and referees and often results in really much improved um, papers at the end. Um, uh, let me just see what else has come in in the meantime. If, if we have missed any of your uh, questions or if we don't get to everything, we, we are aiming to summarize this at the end and get back to you by, by email or feel free to, to follow up directly to Ashley or me afterwards. Um, so here was a question, um, when does the paper get cited? once it's published in PubMed or from the day it is published on the, on the platform. So um, with the examples that I showed you earlier, you can see that the moment an article is published, even before the peer review um, has started, it can be cited. We ask, or the citation details really include the information that is in the uh, title of the article which includes that it's still awaiting peer review but they are citable from uh, the word go which is the beauty of the system there is a permanent identifier associated with each version and um, uh, but of course once the article is then in PubMed and has passed peer review that information is also included in the in the, in the citation so it's always clear to readers which version is being cited and what the referee status is. But it really allows you as, as uh, authors to get your research out there very quickly and uh, put a flag in the sand that this is what you have uh, generated. Um, then we have a question about uh, Ashley, this is probably for you. Does Cronus assign the article to a standard open access journal named by the authors after the open peer review, or is the final revised article uploaded to PMC and therefore not indexed in Medline? Um, yeah, so I think there's a, a couple different questions there. So Cronus is the submission system to any uh, compliant journal. And then either those journals have an agreement to index in PubMed Central uh, directly, or if there is no current agreement with the publisher, Kronos is responsible for ensuring that it is indexed in, in PubMed Central. Um, and then these are, most, most of those journals do not have like an open, peer review, it, it varies, um, but overall, yeah, everything gets indexed. And then, um, what was the second part of the question? Yeah, no, I think you, you've answered this. This was about okay. 
getting it indexed through, through Cronus. Oh, I was going to say for um, Gates Open Research, uh, the different versions end up being indexed as well, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So one, once an article has passed um, peer review, all previous versions and all versions after that get indexed in PubMed and updated. So there's always the latest version uh, there as a default as well. Yeah. Um, there was a question about uh, uh, data, sorry, meta analysis and review papers, whether they are suitable for Gates Open Research. And the answer is uh, yes, we have uh, systematic reviews. Um, and meta-analysis, and uh, we definitely encourage those. They are a great um, addition to the literature, and our model of versioning is particularly useful for, for systematic uh, reviews, for example, because um, if, if authors want to update a systematic review after a little while, because a few additional relevant studies have been published in the meantime, then they can do this through an updated version on the article. It's a real beautiful aspect of this, of this model. Um, so I think we might have time for one more question and then we probably have to um, let these good people go. <laughs> um, Right, so there's, let's take this at the last question, um, and then I apologize that lots more questions in the system, but we'll get back to you afterwards uh, by, by email and summarize those. Uh, so this last question here was, can we publish a baseline survey finding before we complete the project? And again, we, we welcome people uh, publishing uh, some pre preliminary findings um, or an early part of a project before it's fully completed and um, this can often be very useful to get early feedback from referees um, uh, before a study is completed so we would definitely be happy to have those on Gates Open Research as well. So um, I think we'll leave it at this we're really pleased we had some, these were great questions, very um, thoughtful input, and, and we'll take away the comments and get back to you with our answers. As I said, we will send around a link of this webinar and hope that you found this useful. We certainly enjoyed um, uh, doing this, and any more questions, just uh, email us. We're really here to support you as, as grantees and readers. Thank you very much.